Then they send the national anthem. So, Liberty lives some places. If my, if my TV had uh, rewind, I would have watched it ten times. The next day, they got a uh, call from a uh, very popular singer, a uh, country western guy, and he said, "I'll come to." Uh, let me get this up a little bit. He said, I'll come to your school and do a free concert for you. And they were all excited. And the next day, they got a call from somebody else. He called that singer and he said, do you have room on the stage? He said, what do you mean? He said, I'd like to bring my guitar and join you. And he said, who is this? And the guy said, Lee Greenwood. So the, some of the kids started a uh, GoFundMe page. page. We raised a million dollars, and these kids and the fraternity said they were going to donate it all to veterans who were injured or recovered. So, commend them. All right, uh, George Messier was heavily involved in putting this project together, and uh, I was asked to stand in for him this morning. And George had uh, a medical situation in the family and took precedent. Not that he would rather have been here with you folks. He said, Dave, will you sell it for me? And I said, I will do that. He wrote this, and he writes very well, and he speaks even better, but unfortunately, you're going to get stuck with me. I will do the best I can with his speech. See this pocket, Tara Bellum. I know that came from my Latin class many, many years ago, but I don't know what it says. 
but George fills in the blanks. He says, the quote dates back almost 2,000 years, and it says, if you would live in peace, prepare for war. Updated to modern speech, one might say, the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. But after World War II, that timeless truism was cast aside, relegated to the dustbin of history, or so people thought. America emerged from World War II exhausted, but jubilant, and brimming with optimism. Going forward, there would be no further need for sweat, hard training, large standing armies, or rationing coupons. Bring the boys home, echoed across the land. One year after World War II, only three million men remained on active duty. One year later, that number was cut in half. Many of those were serving on occupation duty over in Japan and in Germany. Confidence was pandemic and short-lived. Listen to this. And I'll bet not two people in the room knew this. And I didn't know until George told me. On June 25th, 1950, June 25th, today is what? June 24th. Guess what? Across the state line, it's June 25th. Seven divisions of seasoned North Korean troops crossed the 838th parallel and stormed into South Korea. The 38th parallel was then and remains to this day an artificial line. Nothing more than a line of latitude appearing on a map with no social, economic, geographic, political, or practical relevance to either the Korean peoples or those of neighboring countries north of the river. The coldest war of the Cold War was underway in the years after the war. Then Secretary of State Dean Acheson would say, if the best minds in the world had set out to find us the worst possible location to fight a war, both politically and militarily, the unanimous choice would have been Korea. And renowned military historian L.A. Marshall called it the century's nastiest little war. But I guess he didn't see Vietnam because that was no bargain either. We gather today to honor the greatest generation that met the challenge on the test of time. We honor them today. It was my privilege to say thank you to all of you gentlemen Thank you to the Lieutenant Governor for putting this together and joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. David, thank you so much. And I want to thank our host, Mayor Vincent Cervoni, who, uh, when I called him and asked if he would like to honor Wallingford's Korean veterans and Vietnam era veterans. He was extremely enthusiastic about uh, doing both. Uh, and I want to thank everyone at the town hall, including the veteran service officer, George Messier, the town assessor, Kevin Coombs, the chief appraiser, Ian Fuller, the town clerk, and everyone who found all of you. And you know, you might think that somewhere in Hartford or in Washington, D.C., there's a list of everyone who served in the United States military. But sadly, that list doesn't exist. And literally, the best list of those who <coughs> served lives at every town hall, because that is where you file your DD-214 discharge papers. That is where you file for a veteran's tax exemption. Uh, and so, uh, we are very, very happy that the town of Wallingford has found all of you. Um, I am very proud to say uh, between 2008 and 2010, when I was Secretary of the State, I had the honor of holding 140 public service ceremonies to honor our World War II veterans. Um, and I had the great privilege of meeting more than 15,000 people who served in World War II um, from almost every town in the state. And um, I'm very glad that I did because most of our greatest generation um, are no longer with us. Um, 
along the way, as I was talking to and meeting these World War II veterans, I had the opportunity to meet many Korean veterans because many of those who served in World War II also served in Korea. And so the Korean veterans, before I finished the World War II recognition ceremonies, were lobbying me to start honoring them, uh, which I did. And I'm very proud to say that this is the 105th town that I've had the great pleasure of visiting to say thank you to our Korean veterans. Now, I will tell you that the Korean War was very different from World War II in so many respects. First, it was never officially declared, and it was never officially ended. And so, therefore, that all of those celebrations that you saw at the end of World War II never happened for our Korean soldiers uh, when they got home. You know, that famous World War II picture of the uh, Navy guy kissing the nurse in Times Square, that iconic photo, and everyone is celebrating in the background. Unfortunately, those who served in Korea did not get uh, that welcome. You know, and here we are more than 70 years later to recognize and say, thank you and say welcome home uh, to all of you. David Halberstam has written a book called The Coldest Winter, and it's about uh, those who served in the Korean War. And he said, no matter the bravery they showed or the validity of their cause, the soldiers of Korea have been granted a kind of second-class status compared to the men who had fought in previous wars. And of course, we also know how our soldiers were treated when they returned home from Vietnam. Our Korean military personnel service should be acknowledged, and you should be thanked and recognized for your service, uh, particularly because you served under some of the most difficult circumstances uh, that American soldiers had faced. Um, if you were in Korea, you may have experienced the very harsh terrain and some of the worst weather and record low temperatures. The winter of 1950 uh, had prolonged days of below zero temperatures, and unfortunately, many of our soldiers didn't have the clothing and the equipment that they needed to uh, be able to serve effectively. And many of our American soldiers were vastly outnumbered uh, by the other side. But um, despite all that, what is truly amazing is the resilience that you all showed, um, despite uh, the hardships, the challenges uh, of perhaps losing colleagues, uh, perhaps having um, known people who were prisoners of war. You came back to this beautiful town, raised uh, great families, lived very productive lives. And I think one of the hallmarks of our Korean veterans is you never stopped serving. You may have stopped your military service, but you kept serving, whether it was in uh, veterans organizations, whether it was an elective office or a volunteer of service to the town or to community organizations, you kept serving. And that uh, service is what makes you role models for what good citizens should be. And I will tell you that I've had uh, the great pleasure of meeting thousands of uh, Korean veterans and to the person they are very humble about what they did, and uh, they have uh, really helped make our communities uh, the great places that they are and our state the wonderful place 
that it is. And so today, we have the opportunity to redress the wrong uh, that may have occurred when you came home uh, and didn't get the recognition and the thanks that you have earned. Um, but it is also a time, in addition to saying thank you, to remember the 36,940 people who gave their lives during the Korean War for our country, and to remember the 105,000 Americans who were wounded, and the 6,000 missing in action and prisoner of war. Also, we remember the 326 people from Connecticut who gave their lives in Korea. Uh, we remember their sacrifice, uh, and we are so grateful for your service, for your sacrifice, for our wonderful freedoms that we enjoy in this country. So God bless each of you, your beautiful families, our state, and our great country. Thank you so much. And it's my pleasure to bring up the person that Governor Lamont and I have been trusted with taking care of the several hundred thousand United States military veterans that we have in our state. And it's my pleasure to introduce Commissioner Ron Welch. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor Weisswitz, for that kind introduction and all that you do every single day to support our veterans and families and service members in Connecticut and beyond. Uh, you heard the number of events in the towns that she's visited. It's just incredible to try to pace with her. Uh, to the mayor, thank you for your support. And to the other elected officials that join us today, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to be with us. To those of you that served in Korea or in support of, welcome home. Those were the words that you should have heard when you step back on American soil or when you finish your time in service, and history shows us that didn't happen. As young kids, my friends and I, the other part of the state, the southeastern part of Connecticut, we ran around the woods, we built foxholes, we climbed trees, we climbed the hills, we crossed the streams, we got down in the swamps, and we pre pretended to be what, what you were. Soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen depending on what day it was. My older brother and I listened with absolute amazement to some stories that our Uncle Bob talked about uh, during his time on the ground as a young corporal in Korea. He described some of the most rugged terrain and freezing conditions in the world, not being properly equipped, but pressing on to get the mission done and taking care of the Marines that he served with and other service members. Here's just a quick snapshot. When I look at you, this is what I think about when I think about Korea. And I learned this after my Uncle Bob passed away. On the 3rd of November, 1950, while serving as a fire team leader in Company F, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marine, 1st Marine Division, Private First Class Robert T. Welch instructed his infantry team to cover him. He fearlessly advanced through heavy and accurate sniper and machine gun fire to the side of a wounded Marine located 250 yards to the front of enemy uh, front of lines. He carried him through an enemy barrage to an aid station, allowing him to receive prompt medical attention. Bob was wounded and received a silver star and purple heart for his actions. The reason I signed up back in 1978, right out of high school, was because of people like Uncle Bob and people like you. You're our friends, you're our heroes, and our mentors. I enlisted right out of high school on a challenging path to become an Army Airborne Ranger. We were trained by drill sergeants, airborne and ranger instructors, and served in one of the Ranger at the times with mostly combat veterans. Not a lot were Korean veterans, but there were a few, a lot were Vietnam veterans. And they served as our leadership in that unit. We were never pampered, we were trained hard in the most 
uh, adverse and extreme environments. The mountains, the Cascade Mountains out west, the jungles of Panama, the Arctic in uh, Minnesota and up in Alaska, the deserts out in the Mojave Desert in California, and our missions were always done by land, sea, or air. And we were held accountable for getting the mission done, though we be the lone survivor, just like our Ranger Creed says. This upbringing allowed our team to survive in combat in a highly contested eastern portion of Afghanistan from 2005 to 2006. And I would say uh, throughout many significant challenges after serving for approximately 40 years in the military. From private in the trenches to having the honor to retire as a general officer. Thank you veterans for everything you did. As many of you know, after the war of military service, whether it was a couple years or a whole career, life back to what many consider normal life again, has a lot of challenges on you as a service member and also on your families. Isolation and suffering and silence really isn't the answer and it's never too late to ask for help. And every time we go out and look around the crowd and I know that there are folks out there that have too much pride, they said I can do this alone and they never ask for any help. And I'd encourage you, regardless of what your age is, if you struggle, you have nightmares, flashbacks, or anxiety, or depression, please see a therapist. When you close that door, everything's 100% confidential. And if you don't really want to do it yourself, please do it for your family. Uh, they will feel a lot better for you doing that. Please take advantage of what we have, and I'm, guest, I'm honored today to have one of our staff members with us, Lindsay. Please raise your hand. Lindsay's one of our key staff members at Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs in Rocky Hill. And over there, we have four core missions. We have a residential program. We have, uh, for 150 folks, we can go beyond that. We have a skill care facility that's highly rated for 125. Very important to you is our Office of Advocacy and Assistance. They are located in five district offices around Connecticut, Waterbury, Fairfield, Milford, Newington, and Norwich. A couple weeks ago on a Friday, we trained approximately 90 municipal vet representatives, and I'm so glad to hear your great town has one. I believe his first name is George. That is the go-to person. That person is really the representative on your behalf that can connect you with the many, many benefits that you've earned. You know, basic things, whether it's connecting with with your tax assessor, for local services, for transportation, health, food, housing, employment, whatever it may be. And they also are the direct link to certified veteran service officers that can put that claim together for you. And if you haven't been to the VA lately, you really need to connect with that veteran service officer. So many benefits have been expanded. There were about 18 additional presumptive illnesses that were expanded about a year and a half ago and just last Friday, they, they added three different cancers to those benefits. So please reach out and make sure you get an interview and you fill out an application. If you've ever been injured or ill while you're in the military. And I want to say that our team, that small team that I talked about, at those five locations, has helped 9,000 uh, clients in Connecticut and you know, veterans and family members that provided $125 million back to veterans and their families. And they continue to do great work every day. And then finally, we still have, uh, or we have two active cemeteries. We had three. One is still down in Darien. We have one across in Rocky Hill that has about 1,600 buried there. And the one down, beautiful one down in Mid Middletown, looks like a mini Arlington. We have approximately 16,000 family members and veterans interred there. So as I close, we'll never be able to thank you enough for the services and sacrifices that you all made during your time. Thank you very much. Commissioner, thank you so much. It's my pleasure to bring up our host, Mayor Cervoni. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant Governor, for 
providing uh, my office, you, you and your staff providing my office with the roadmap that um, was then provided to, to staff at Town Hall to get us here today. Um, you heard talk of uh, George Messier, our Veterans Affairs, uh, Veterans Services Coordinator. Um, George sends his regrets. He had every intention of being here today until he had to deal with the personal the issue. So as I look around the room, I see familiar faces because I've definitely come in time in contact with many of you at various points. And another reason why I see familiar faces, whether I've met you before or not, is because you are my parents' age. Um, I was born at the end of the 1960s. And um, that's significant because I went to school from 1973 uh, primary school until 1986 and the reason why I bring up those years is because the details surrounding this conflict were under talk. Um, for whatever reason during the period of my education um, you were under acknowledged uh, during this period in American history. It, it was everything that happened before you that we were taught about in school. And what I've learned since then was uh, through college and through uh, entertainment and my own reading. What you represent is the fact that you are the face of freedom for this country at the time that you served. What I mean by that is whether you volunteered or not, you would have done nothing differently when called than to get to work and to fly halfway across the planet or sail halfway across the planet to get to a place where freedom was in jeopardy and you did what this nation called you to do and you sought to protect that freedom. So on the back of your programs, there's a quote from Calvin Coolidge. No person was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been given the reward for what he gave. Or she. But what's significant about that to me is that this isn't why you did it. This isn't why you did what you did. You did what you did because it represented your values. At the time that you did it, this is what society did. This is what we as Americans did. So you're not here because you seek honor. Honor is here for you because we feel that you are well, well deserving of it. When the governor's office called me and asked me if I'd like to participate in this opportunity, it was an unhesitant yes because I am grateful and the town of Wallingford <coughs> certainly are grateful for all you've done for American freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor, thank you so much. Uh, we are joined by two fierce fighters for Wallingford in our state legislature, and we will start with State Representative Liz Lennon. Thank you very much. I hope you'll all bear with me. I have an allergy cough, so I may be interrupted, but I brought my trusty water. Uh, I'd like to begin um, by thanking the Lieutenant Governor for asking us to be here today, uh, to the Commissioner, to the Mayor. Thank you so very much uh, for putting this together. Uh, but of course, today we are here to celebrate you. It is a privilege to stand before you and express my deepest gratitude for your unwavering courage and sacrifice. The Korean War was a testament to the indomitable spirit of our nation. Despite the challenges and adversities you faced, you stood strong, defending freedom and democracy with unwavering resolve. Your bravery in the face of danger has left an indelible mark on our history and an incredible parable for our youth today, who may not understand that we as a nation are actually on the cusp of losing the democracy that you fought so valiantly for. They don't understand how precious, fragile, and sacred our freedoms are, but you do. And for that, I thank you. 
as a leader, as the chairwoman of the Committee on Children in our legislature, and the former vice chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee, I stand before you today with a promise. We spoke, we heard from our Lieutenant Governor and from our Commissioner and even from our Mayor, and I'm sure we'll hear from Representative Mashinsky the same, that it is known to us that your bravery and sacrifice was not um, applauded in the real time that it should have been. So I promise something to you all today. I promise to share your stories of bravery and courage with current and future generations. Your experiences sacrifices and triumphs, they deserve to be heard, remembered, honored, and most importantly, learned from. It is our duty to ensure that the legacy of your service lives on and the service of your families, inspiring generations to come to continue to fight for democracy and protect this nation from enemies, both foreign and domestic. Your stories filled with valor, resilience, and camaraderie will serve as a beacon of inspiration for our youth. Through sharing your experiences, we will instill in them those values of honor, duty, and sacrifice that you embody every day. They will learn the importance of freedom, the price that was paid to secure it, and the absolute necessity to preserve it. Through your bravery and heroism, we will remind our youth just how fragile our democracy can be, but through perseverance and sacrifice, they, like you, can ensure that American democracy lives on. Through your bravery and heroism, we will remind our youth just how fragile it can be, not only by honoring your service, but also to remind the world of the enduring spirit that defines our nation. To all the veterans present here today, I thank you in honor. In honor of my grandpa Linehan, who served, I thank you. Thank you for your service, your sacrifice, your entrusting us with the responsibility of preserving your legacy. It is something we take so seriously. May your stories shine as a beacon of hope and courage now and for generations to come. So here's to you, the heroes who shaped our nation's history and whose legacy will continue to inspire generations to do the same. We honor you. We thank you.
unending situation in that, in that at the end of the war it was more like trench warfare than anything else, not really moving too much in either direction. I know that my uncle, who was uh, in the Navy at the time and is still alive, uh, was assigned to rescue some of the troops when they got down to the coastline. Uh, his ship would come in and he, and he never explained any of this to me until I pressed him on it, but his ship would come in and uh, rescue the soldiers and bring them to safety as the line shifted back and forth. I, I am aware, as the mayor has said, that this is the forgotten war in many people's minds. Uh, when it ended in 1953, it was still considered a, a police action by some because Congress had never declared war. And it was overshadowed by all veterans from World War II who had come home several years earlier. So we were kind of in the squeezed in the middle there. And uh, it is therefore important for us to remember you and to acknowledge you as you are the 4% now. Our town has been very good about honoring those who served and died in the Korean War. We have a, a monument outside of Town Hall, which was dedicated in 1995, and I'm sure you were all there with your families. Uh, it, it was dedicated on the anniversary of the start of the war, and there are, as far as I'm aware, 1,846 names on the monument. And occasionally new ones are added as they're discovered. At that time, in 1995, at the dedication, uh, one of the hosts of the ceremony uh, read a quote by Frank Parcarelli, who was a soldier in the Korean War. And he said, some of the blinder veterans left and prayed, but when they returned, they came back quietly. They picked up their lives. Some of them went back to school. Some found jobs. And some are still lying in VA hospitals throughout the country. That was a salute to you then. As the mayor said, we have to remind everyone to honor you for the rest of your lives, for your service. You're not the forgotten war any longer. We honor you, we respect you, and we thank you. And uh, I did want to mention uh, that at the legislature this year, we did do a, a bill to exempt veterans from property taxes if they're totally disabled. That means that everyone else's taxes go up a little bit, but we're doing it in honor of them. You will be willing to pay that little extra on behalf of those veterans. I, I know I am. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to be here to honor you today. All right, so here's the good news. The boring part where all the politicians talk is done. And so now the, the good part is, and the part that everybody remembers, is when we have the opportunity to hear from our veterans about where they served, what they did, maybe they could tell us a little story or uh, talk about their experience. And so sometimes we have a traveling mic. Um, I don't know how long this court goes, but I'll just start over here. And I know that when we get to this part, people just look at me and they say, oh, in the Army and the Navy, I learned never to volunteer. But, but, but um, I am sure everyone here would love to hear maybe a few words about your service. So I'm going to wander over here and see if any of these fine gentlemen over here would like to say a couple words. Yes? OK. Here you go. You can just speak from your seat or stand up. 1950 was a very difficult 1950 was a very difficult year for me because I got to engaged in November, a part of May, and 10 days later I got my draft notice. 
and I left for Korea in December. And so, um, as the lady said, it was a crazy way to start a marriage, and it's a crazy way to start your life, but it seems to work out eventually in the end. You just got volunteered. <laughs> right, make sure you say your name, please. Well, I didn't go to Korea. When I went to the army room to get my orders, they told me you're going to Saudi Arabia. So I didn't see any action, but I saw a lot of sand. <laughs> I was there for a year, and I came back to the States, went down to Dover, finally got discharged. Thank you. Currently, after I graduated high school in 1953, I got an invitation from the government that I would like to be to join the Forces. I thought about it for a while, and I said, well, I always liked airplanes ever since I was a kid, so I chose to enlist in the Air Force. I have no more stories about the war or anything like that. I did my duty to my country, and frankly, I enjoyed my service in the Air Force. I give a lot of thanks to those others that went before me and really served the country. Thank you. I had the early <coughs> in my career in the Army, it started very, very early based on I was in the Connecticut State National Guard. We were federalized in anticipation of going to Korea. We were fortunate in many ways that after our basic training, we were shipped to Augsburg, Germany as a backup for the necessary being at the location in Augsburg, Germany where we served we were a close backup for the Korea area that was in common at the time. From that, at age 18, very energetic, and found that as time progressed, we became more realistic of thinking of what we were doing here and what was our purpose. And we felt that we did participate, and I think we did a great job in backing up those guys that did make it to the combat zone. And we were fortunate to be still part of what developed with all of us. And you old timers, and I'm not old, but I'm just a Korean vet, so you all could do the math. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, can you just tell us where you served? We're in Augsburg, Germany. Ah, got it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, sir. I joined the Navy in June of 1949, and uh, I was on an LFC, and uh, we were training UVD. I tried to get in, but since I had an operation more than young, I got rejected afterwards, and then I was transferred up to our GNC group of land in the craft seat air rescue unit, and uh, from there, Transmit to American carrier USS Long Island. And the boats he had, it was when the captains gave him the arms of water launch. It was helpful. And I uh, met my wife, 71 years. And, uh, so, at the last. There she is. Do you agree with everything you said? <laughs> Uh, what a beautiful family. Uh, thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, I served from 
54 to 56. However, I was lucky enough to go to Japan rather than Korea. But I was halfway up Mount Fuji at a Marine Corps artillery base, and I stayed there for 18 months. And no trees, no grass, nothing but volcanic ash. audience would like to know what years did you serve because you spanned from World War II to Vietnam? Uh, 51 to 52. 51 to 52. Okay. Thank you so much. Vietnam War. Okay. I remember being a child, seven years old, driving my brother Jack, who was in the Army, who was drafted, to New York to pick up a troop ship uh, for Korea. He was in the 25th Infantry Division, and by the grace of God, the armistice was signed while he was on that troop ship. He served for many months in Korea because he was very active. North Koreans were upholding the troops. The memory of Jack leaving for war uh, terrorized me and uh, instilled in me uh, the value of serving your country and I'm not to serve in Vietnam. My brother Tom will talk on his own behalf, uh, serve in the Air Force. And, and we'll see you at 4.30. Oh. Thank you. 
forces, force to Russia at all times. They had different patterns of life. And I saw it always from Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Greenland, and uh, and the whole, all of them. Uh, and that had a tournament, and it was kind of took away from the communists, so they went all over there. And uh, I think I knew that. That's about it. Speak on I'll speak behalf. on his behalf real quick. My dad was in the Navy, and like the commissioner said, this generation was totally different. Uh, they couldn't wait to serve. My dad actually lied, and said he was 18. He was 17 when he enlisted and forged my grandmother's signature to get to the to get to the Navy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and he wasn't the only one. I mean, I've heard that from many, many people. That was something that happened a lot. We're proud of him. Thank you. All right, any other veteran who hasn't spoken who would like to? Going once? All right, okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to recognize each of our veterans individually. And what we'll do is um, we will e we'll call each person up. And if you snuck in here and you didn't tell us that <laughs> you're here don't worry we're not gonna leave until we recognize everyone um, and if it is easier for you to receive your citation in your seat just raise your hand and we'll go right to you all right and we also have darian mclaren from uh congresswoman deloro's office and he will also be helping us give out citations we appreciate him being here on behalf of the congressman Begin with Frank Barisi. Okay. All right, Mr. Parisi, we're pa we're practicing on you because everyone's going to want to see how this. We're practicing on you. Everyone wants to see how this is going to go, so you're going to stand right here in the middle. Okay. All right, let's give him a round. Of Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you. John. John Markey. Gary Morgan. Thank you. 
Are there any Korean War veterans in Wallingford whose name we have not called?